what I want to talk to you about tonight is how do you prepare an emergency plan for yourself? If an emergency occurs and the next thing you know, you hear, Cal Fire, you have 20 minutes to evacuate. If you don't have a written plan, the first thing that's going to happen is your brain goes into absolute overload. And if they did it on my door, my brain would go into overload also. The difference is I have a written plan. I don't have to be able to think. I just have to be able to read. And I can take out this written plan and go this, this, this. So that's one of the things that I want to talk to you about tonight. Disasters come in all shapes and sizes. These are the ones that we're most likely to see in Mendocino County. Fires, obviously. Flooding, especially on the coast. But we can have some torrential rainstorms that flood out roads. There's been a couple of times, I'm up, up in Laytonville, there's been a couple of times where 101 has been closed, going across Little Lake because the water is across the road. And then the one that is going to happen someday is an earthquake. How many of you know what the Makama Fault is? Okay, the Makama Fault starts just south of, of uh, Santa Rosa and it basically follows 101 all the way up to just north of Laytonville. It's called the Creep Fault. It moves uh, 6.5 millimeters a year. If you go over to the Safeway and look on that stretch of road that goes over towards um, Willits Furniture, you'll see some cracks in the sides. That's where it runs. If that ever slips, it's probably going to take out 101. If it takes out 101, that means we get no gas, no food, nothing in the hardware stores because everything comes up 101 from the, from the south. So for emergency planning, if you want to assess all possible situations, look at your situation. Where are you located? If you're in the city, you're going to have some things that you're going to have to look at. If you live out in the country, you're going to have other things you have to look at. City, you have, have pg and &E gas. Out in the country, you probably have propane. You have to look at the different things that are going to affect you personally when you make your plan. You have to have a written plan or checklist. Like I said, if you don't have it in writing, the first thing that's going to happen, there's going to be that knock on the door and you're going to run around your house going, what do I take? I had this happen with a neighbor when we had the big lightning strike fires. I went over to help him, and he was running around his house with a Cal Fire battalion chief and two sheriffs standing at the door, and her, the battalion chief was saying, no, now means now. And he was trying to figure out what he was going to take. Unfortunately, he decided to grab some things that I looked at and went, uh, maybe you should look for like your money, important papers, stuff like that as opposed to knickknacks and so on. Have a hard copy of the plan. Don't keep it on your computer. We just had a, a three-day power out or communications outage. If you have it on your computer, it's not going to help. Have it in writing. My plan's in writing in a manila envelope on the inside of a cabinet in my kitchen, and I have a mechanical pencil with it. As I do things, I cross it off. Why a mechanical pencil? They don't dry out. You put a pen up there, it could be dry. Prepare an emergency kit, and when you prepare it, have a list of contents of what's in that kit. In the handouts, there's a thing about having a personal kit, a family kit, and a vehicle kit. And each one can contain some similar objects, but some are gonna contain different ones. If you have a list in there, when you unzip it, you look at it and you go, oh, now I know everything that's in here. My first aid kits, when you flip the lid up, there's a list of everything that's in there. So I know exactly what's in it. And be proactive. Don't wait till the last minute. We had, uh, I live up by Laytonville, we had a fire on Shamrock. 
and I could see the smoke coming over the hill and I went, you know, maybe we should take all this stuff and move it over into the kitchen by the back door, which we did. Then I saw the flames on the top of the hill and I said, maybe it's time to put it in all the vehicles, which we did. They got the fire out. What did I have to do? I just had to put everything back. On the other hand, if it had come down that hill, I'm packed, I'm ready, I can go. Don't wait till the last minute. On the other hand, if you happen to have a fire and it's 15 miles away, you probably don't have to evacuate yet. When we had the big fire up in Leighton, but we had a number of people, they were eight, 10 miles away from the fire. Should we evacuate now? No. Try and keep a level head. Look at what's going on and where it's going. Um, fires normally don't move that fast that they're gonna cover 10 miles before the fire department can tell you that you can evacuate. So you're gonna have a plan. You're gonna list your important items on the plan. List the item that you wanna take, and this is something where you have to sit down with every member of the family and talk to every member of the family. Why do you have to talk to every member of the family? If any of you have kids and you say, grab your important stuff, we have to go, you're gonna to get to the shelter, you have a car full of Justin Bieber CDs and defrosted Hot Pockets, because that's what's important to them. You discuss it with all the members of the family and you make up a list. And here's the priority. My wife and I sat down, we came up with this list, and, well, I think this, no, this, okay, we'll switch those and you move them around. Check the list annually. You probably have get new stuff every year. You might get rid of old stuff. So you update the list. Where are they stored? Okay, I want to take the jewelry. Where is it? It's in the bedroom here. So I can look at the list. I can say, jewelry goes next. Here's where it is. And I even list which vehicle it goes into. I happen to have a Jeep and a big truck. Why do you list it that way? You can't get the 60 inch widescreen TV in the Volkswagen. And when it comes time to go, people will try to do that. I know that I can pull the drawers out of my filing cabinet and place them right in the truck. I know that very little is going in my Jeep because it's gonna have my wife, it's gonna have my 70 pound uh, border collie and my 140 pound Bernie's Mountain Dog. That pretty much fills up a Jeep. So where are they stored, which vehicle are they go into, and you can even list who loads the items. Now there are some things that I would be loading up my wife can't pick up, so it's my job. There are some things that my wife really values that you can bet is gonna be in one of those vehicles somewhere. And do a multi-phase list based on time. I have a list that is set up so that if I have 15 minutes, here's what we take. If I have another 15 minutes, here's the other thing we, things we take. If I have plenty of time, here are the other things we take. But list your most important things first. Sample list, emergency cash. I'm gonna put the emergency cash in the car, the bank book from the desk in the car, credit cards I'm gonna have on me, Photo boxes from the closet, they're gonna go in the truck. Tax forms and important papers from the filing cabinet, they go in the truck. Guns and ammo from the office, they go in the truck. You make up your list. And you decide what's most important and where you're gonna put it. Emergency money, it is of utmost importance that you look at this and get a, at least $100 in ones and fives and keep it somewhere at home. Because when the power goes out, ATMs don't work, credit card readers don't work. Nothing, nothing that you have as far as using a debit or credit card is gonna help you. If you have a package of ones and fives and you walk in the store and you wanna buy something and it's 315, you can hand them $4. I'll eat the 85 cents. I don't want to hand them a 20. 
So look at just getting some uh, emergency cash to have on hand. The amount is up to you. Some people would look at this and go, man, I need $100 and it'll be fine. Others are going to look and say, I need $1,000. I have a really big truck that sucks a lot of gas. Have a vehicle go bag. One of the things in your handouts talks about a personal bag for your vehicle. Vehicle go bag can be virtually anything. It can be a backpack. It can be any kind of, I recommend something, a fairly sturdy bag. And you're going to have a pair of pants, shirt, socks, shoes, change of underwear, sweater, gloves, rain poncho. You can add a sick pack of water, some granola bars, and it's a good 24-hour emergency kit. I carry mine in my vehicle all the time. Why? Because if I'm driving back to Laytonville and I slide off the road and nobody sees it, I could be down in some ravine for 24 hours before somebody notices that, hmm, Mike didn't come home. And they send somebody out to look for me. And also keep a first aid kit, a blanket, and some tools in your vehicle. Tools are simple. Uh, hammer, pair of pliers, a couple of screwdrivers, jumper cables, and duct tape and WD-40. If it moves and it's not supposed to, you use the duct tape. If it's supposed to move and it doesn't, you use a WD-40. That's my go bag. Now, you'll notice that up in the upper left-hand corner, there's a really hideous orange shirt. That's my T-shirt. I bought that one the first time I put it on. My wife reached over and grabbed her sunglasses, put them on, and I knew I would not be wearing that shirt anymore. So it's in my go bag. I have underwear, knit cap, scarf, some handkerchiefs, old pair of jeans, old shirt, old sweatshirt, socks, water, granola bars, a couple pair of gloves, two ponchos, some handy wipes, and a notebook and pencil. When you make your go bag, it can be any old clothes. You're, you're evacuating an emergency, you're not going to a fashion show. So I found an old pair of ratty jeans and an old shirt and my wonderful orange t-shirt and they're in my go bag. You can put more stuff in there. Talk to one of the CERT team members, mention this, and he went out and he got one of those great big black plastic bins with the big yellow top. It's got to be like a 80 quart thing and he put a lot of stuff in his and he couldn't pick it up remember it's a go bag so you want to be able to pick it up and go emergency notifications have an emergency rallying point for evacuations now have two you're going to have one a little distance from the house that's in case the house catches on fire Everybody in the family rallies at this point. You're also going to have one a good distance away. That's in case the whole neighborhood catches on fire. You're going to actually travel and get, try and get to the furthest location. I actually have three. One is outside my house where the fire hydrant is. It's about 140 feet from the house. One of them is down at the rest area on 101, which is basically the entrance to get in and out of where I live. If that whole area is on fire, the other one's here in Willis at the parking lot at St. Anthony's Church. Why the parking lot at St. Anthony's Church? There are no trees, there are no poles, there are no power lines. I can sit in the middle of this and I don't have to worry about stuff falling on me. If you can manage to sneak into the uh, football field at Willis High School, there's a lot of nothing around there. It's, it would be great. So you want a rallying point that's fairly close to the house and then one that's quite distant. And have an outer area contact. If something happens, you can, and you can't get a hold of family members, and you can call someone who's in another state and say, hi, this is Mike. I'm fine. I'm over at St. Anthony's Church. Let my wife know if she calls. Then she calls that number. Have you heard from Mike? Yeah, he's at St. Anthony's Church. He's fine, blah, blah, blah. Where are you? Finds out where she is. Then I call back a little while later. Hi, have you heard from Robin? Yeah, she's over here. She's on her way over to St. Anthony's Church. Great. I know where my, where my family is. 
Now, my out-of-town out of contact happens to be in, in Los Angeles because I figured 600 miles is far enough away. You know, if, if you were in New York, that covers almost the entire East Coast to have somebody as far as an out-of-area out of, uh, contact. We're now going to talk about extended emergencies. These are all the things you have to consider. Food availability, water availability, shelter, clothing, hygiene, first aid, and personal protection. So let's look at emergency food. In an extended emergency, supermarkets will be, will be empty. How many of you watch the hurricanes come into Florida, and what do they show on the news every time? The empty supermarket. Because nobody has enough stuff at home, and they quickly run down, and the supermarket shelves are, are wiped out. When you store the food, consider the shelf life and the ease of preparation. You don't want to store food that is going to be really time consuming and require a lot of preparation. Store stuff that's real easy. Rice, spaghetti, um, noodles. I happen to have some canned beef, some canned chicken. I have bags of rice, I have bags of noodles. I need one pot and a cup of water. And I can make a meal for two people. Really, really simple, easy to fix. You want to eat the store food in the stored order. Anything that's in your refrigerator goes first. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times people have microwave stuff in their freezer, and unless you have some other way of cooking it, it's just gone. Short shelf life, anything that's in boxes or plastic bags, you're going to eat your, you know, your fresh bread and stuff first. And the long shelf life, anything that's in cans and jars that will last a long time. Um, the canned beef and chicken I get has a shelf life of about three years. So I swap it out every other year. I do half of it. Store the amount of food that makes you feel comfortable. Everything you're going to look at in that handout, read it. Do what makes you feel comfortable. If you're comfortable, hey, I've got three days supply of food on hand, that is fantastic. If you live out where I do, I looked at it one, I want a two week supply. Because if we have a slide on one of the dirt roads out there, it's gonna be a while before we can get anybody to come in and clear our roads because they're gonna be out trying to clear 101 and 162 and Highway 20 and so on. So two weeks makes me feel, yeah, you know, I can make it on two weeks. Store the initial supply in the house in a cupboard or closet. Um, you can get, again, you can get a, uh, like a military backpack, stuff all the stuff in there. Stick it in one of the closets. Make a list of what's in there. And if you have canned items, don't forget a can opener. Very important to have the can opener. Re really hard to chew through a can to get it open. Store additional stuff in a second location, a garage, an outbuilding, any other place you have. It's the old all your chickens in one basket story. If you have all your emergency food in your house and your house is on fire, what do you do? If you have some food in your house and some food in a building over here, you lose one, you still have the other stuff to fall back on. Use solid storage containers, like military foot lockers or strong plastic bins. Now here's one where you can go down to Home Depot or you can go over to Middle Mill and get some of those plastic bins and you can store stuff in it. Make sure you can move it. <laughs> um, when they had the Lower Lake Fire, I worked a point of, point of distribution over there and we were passing out plastic bags and shovels and rakes where people could sift, sift through the remains of their house, put the trash in the bag. They put out, we were issuing bags that you could fit two of me in. And we had to tell them, don't fill the bag because you fill this whole bag with bricks and plaster and wood and everything, you aren't going to move it. But you can get, uh, I'm fortunate having been in the military as long as I was, I got some real nice great wooden military or wooden ammo cans, boxes. Sealed the inside with duct tape, 
spray painted the inside, put the stuff in. They're just about watertight. They'll actually float. Now, they make some smaller ammo cans now that are plastic. They're like nine bucks over at uh, Ace Hardware. But they sealed completely. You put stuff in, they have a rubber seal on the top. When you lock it down, that stuff is going to be fine just about forever. Example of things that you can store. You'll notice down here we've got um, roast beef and gravy, some chicken, some Vienna sausage, bumblebee tuna, spam. For those of you who can tolerate spam, I was in the military too long to eat spam anymore. Quaker oats. The one thing I would do on the Quaker oats, that's a cardboard container. I put it in a plastic container. But here you've got rice, you've got spaghetti, pinto beans, and honey. Honey is the one substance on earth that never spoils. They have found vases in Egypt from the pharaohs with honey in them. It's still good. It'll crystallize, but if you put it in warm water, it turns back into honey. If you're going to maintain emergency food, you have to rotate it annually. Like I said, most of the stuff that I have, I buy the chicken and the beef. They normally have a two, eh, two and a half year shelf life. Every year I rotate half of it. I take the chicken and the beef that I have, and during the next six months I eat it. So nothing goes to waste. Canned items will last two years or so, so they're replaced semi-annually. Check the expiration date before you buy them. Pick up the can, look on the bottom. Hey, this stuff is good until 2020. I'm going to buy some cans of this. Make sure you buy stuff that everybody likes. If you buy the, uh, wow, these canned sardines are really good for the next 20 years. Well, you're going to have something that you can probably play dominoes with, but nobody's going to eat them. Include condiments, salt, pepper, garlic powder, whatever things that you want to add to it that will give it a little more taste. Because nothing, nothing is worse than sitting down to a really bland meal for the next two weeks. By the end of the first week, you're sitting there going, oh man, am I going to eat that again? So add some condiments to it. And always check the expiration date before consuming the store food. Now... On canned stuff, if it's six months past the expiration date, that's no big thing. As long as the cans aren't dented and they aren't swollen. If you're starting to look at cans and going, uh, this said best used by 2012, I wouldn't eat it. Just toss it. They put those on there for a reason, but none of them are. You know, this says April of 2017 and it's May. It's good. It's not that when it hits this month, it's ruined. Like I said, buy foods that are easy to prepare. Something where you need a pot and some water. Rice, noodles, pinto beans, um, oatmeal. You can do all of that. Oatmeal with some honey in it, great, great meal. Keep the meal simple. Now, they do have places where you can buy prepackaged number 10 cans, or big cans, of chicken cacciatore, veal scallopini, I mean, all kinds of stuff that is survival food. They aren't cheap, but they're packed in nitrogen, they're freeze-dried, and they're guaranteed to last for 25 years. So if you buy some of these cans and you put them away, you don't have to worry about them for the next 25 years. They'll still be good. It takes a lot of water to rehydrate them, but from what I understand, that they're really pretty good meals. Make a list of the items you need to prepare the foods you purchase. And prepare a separate container or backpack for all the kitchen items. You want to have one place. You want to have a portable kitchen. What's in your portable kitchen? Well, in your portable kitchen, you have a pot to cook simple meals. Get a Teflon just for ease of cleaning. I'd recommend getting two and having one with a lid. 
That way, if you have one with a lid there, there are something like rice. Rice, you normally put the, put the water in, put a lid on, let it sit there, and it absorbs the water. Large spoon for cooking, compatible with Teflon so you don't scratch the pot. Metal or non-breakable bowl for each person. Why a bowl? You can put soup in a bowl, you can't on a plate. Same thing with using a spoon as opposed to a fork. You can eat soup with a spoon. Real hard to eat soup with a fork. Metal or non-breakable cup per person. The ever-present can opener, one of those little twist can openers that works great. A large knife for slicing canned breads or other items in case you have something that you have to cut up. Coffee or teapot for boiling and heating water. Use it only for water. You don't want to put anything in there that, hey, you know, I use this to make myself some really strong coffee and now you're going to heat up water in there that you're going to use for your rice. Guess what? Your rice is going to have a slight coffee taste. So use one just for water. And then a Coleman propane stove. Two burners are best. I have, have a two burner. They last about a week on one of those little green things of gas. And that's cooking two meals a day plus heating water. If you get one of those, don't forget to get the spark igniter so that you can get it lit. As I said, propane or natural gas may be disrupted, but a two burner Coleman stove will run about a week on a, on a uh, tank of gas for two meals plus hot water. If you happen to have a propane Coleman lantern, you'll go through one of those green bottles in about at night. They use a lot. Avoid using propane in an enclosed space, which is obvious because you don't want to suffocate. A solar shower is a great alternative for hot water. You fill up a five gallon solar shower, you stick it outside in the sun, and believe me, if it's in the summer, you're gonna end up with water that will have steam coming out of it. When we first moved up, or when we first came up here, we had a little cabin, and I built a little shower stall and everything, and I put out the two solar showers for about 11 hours. My wife was the first one to take a shower, and I'm really glad, because the things that she said, I hadn't heard since I was down in Long Beach on the docks. And when she unzipped that solar shower, steam came out. We ended up taking a solar shower, draining half the water out and putting cold in to make it just about right for a shower. It, they really get hot. If you're gonna use a solar shower for your hot water, that solar shower should only be used for pure water. It should not be used for anything else. Because I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna fill it with fresh water, I'm gonna heat it, I'm gonna use it for cooking. And that's pretty much it. You don't want to use it for something else. Plus, it's going to save you a ton on propane. So, you get a large plastic bucket with a lid. You can use that to wash, wash your dishes and stuff. You can also store all the food preparation equipment in it. You got your pots and pans and knives and spoons and everything else. It's all in one package. Get a nylon scrubber sponge for cleaning the food preparation items. That won't scratch up the Teflon. Liquid soap, you can use the, the liquid soft soap to wash dishes with. So you've got a dual purpose. You can wash your hands, you can wash your face, you can wash your dishes. And get towels. You wanna to dry the items that you're washing and also clean the tops of the cans before you use them. If you have cans that you've had for a long time, you wanna make sure that the tops are, are clean before you open them up. Water. Water is of ultimate importance. The average person needs about a gallon a day. In the, in the summer, you're gonna need more than that. You lose power, you're gonna lose your water system, especially for those of us who are outside the city where we need a well pump to pump the water out of, out of a well or a pressure pump to pump it into the house. You can store initial supplies in bottles. You're gonna to have to get a lot of bottles to store up enough water for, say, four people at a gallon a day. You can think about where you can obtain additional water. Lakes and streams, wells and tanks. Now most people who have a well and a tank also have some kind of a filtration system. If you're pulling out of a lake or a stream, you're not gonna have that. But there's three ways you can purif purify it. One is by boiling. 
But boiling, you're going to be using up a lot of propane to boil the water. The other is chemical purification. They make water purification tablets you can put in. And water filters. Water filters are low volume. It's like those, those water straws you can stick in a stream and drink directly out of it. That's fine if you want a little drink from a stream. If you want to fill a five-gallon water can, it's not going to work. The easiest way is to use bleach. Use unscented bleach. The springtime fresh and the lemon bleach and all that, they put, they put extra chemicals in there you don't want to have in you. Number one, you are going to have a bucket for scooping water out of a stream. You're going to have a bucket for purifying water. You don't use the, ever switch the two. This bucket only has fresh water in it. So you go out, you scoop the stream up, you take your bleach, eight drops per gallon, and you put your eight drops a gallon in, in your gallon of water, and you'll let it sit for about 30 minutes. Let all the stuff settle out as much as possible. Now I'm going to put it in the fresh water container, but before I do, I'm going to take an old t-shirt, I'm going to stretch it across the top of that container, and I'm going to pour the water in. T-shirts are phenomenal strainers. They'll get all of the garbage and stuff out of the water. I have it in the second bucket, and I look at it and go, eh, I don't smell any bleach. Eh, put about eight more drops in. Never more than 16. And you'll end up with a gallon of purified water. You can use a uh, teaspoon for five gallons. One gallon will purify 3,800 gallons of water. I have a 2,500 gallon water tank at home that I know for a fact will last my wife and I three weeks. Because one time I shut it off to clean the filter and three weeks later I turned on the tap and nothing happened. Because the tank was dry. So we use about 2,500 gallons in three weeks. And tape an eyedropper to the bleach bottle. Not a glass one, get a plastic one. Glass ones can break. Some people will look at this and go, I don't want to put bleach in my body. That's up to you. This will give you pure water. It'll give you water that's safe to drink. Um, if you want to risk it and drink some water that you haven't purified this way, that's up to you. You can boil it. Or you can use the, the other uh, water purification tablets. But that's up to you. One container for unclean water. You can strain the unclean through a cloth. Use a separate container for clean water. Never use unclean water for cooking or drinking. And a 30-gallon plastic drum will last about, two, about a week for two people. Sheltering. You have to have shelter from both heat and from cold. Your primary residence is your best shelter. As long as everything's okay with, the, with your house, stay in there. Unless you have 15 minutes to get out. If anybody comes up and they're wearing a uniform and they knock on the door and they say, get out, go. Don't risk it. If you stay, there is a good chance you will not get out. Um, the fire department here is actually very kind and friendly. If you are in L.A. and they go, you have to go now and you go no, they'll say, fine, who's your next of kin? I want you to sign this form. So that when they come through later and find your remains, they know who you are. And when your next of kin sues, they go, they wouldn't leave. Here's where they signed. So if they knock on the door, don't argue with them. Just prepare and evacuate. You should have an alternate in the case the primary is damaged. It can be a garage, an outbuilding, a cabin, or even a vehicle. Um, I have a little camping cabin that we built about 600 miles, from, 600 miles, 600 feet from where we put in the house, and that's my secondary. I keep my secondary stuff down there because I figure if something happens to the house, hopefully 600 feet will be far enough away that nothing will happen to that. But it does give me another place that I can go in. 
It's got four solid walls, a nice ceiling. That's where I keep my Coleman stove, my propane lantern, um, some extra propane, extra food, uh, extra generator. We'll talk about generators in a minute. And a little electric heater. So I can survive in that in the winter. Sanitation. Toilet facilities can often become disrupted if you have any disruption in the water supply or in power. Now, I know with my house, because I live out in the country, I need electricity to pull the water out of my well, put it in my tank, into my pressure pump, into my pressure tank, and into my house. If I lose power, I have a generator. Vroom, and off it goes, as long as the gas lasts. If the toilet facilities do become inoperative and water is available, you can walk down to the local stream or whatever and go pour it in the toilet tank and it flushes the toilet. Uh, we, lost, we lost power up there and I had four buckets sitting in the bathtub. It saved gas from going out there to start the generator every time we wanted to use a toilet. We just... You can use a bucket in a plastic bag as a porta potty. They also make hassock sized porta potties. A little round thing. Actually, has a nice little toilet seat on it. You can use both the plastic bucket and the por porta potty to store the toilet paper in, some handy wipes, some plastic bags, because you're probably going to want to change that at least once a day. You don't want to use a porta potty for three or four days. It, it gets really ripe. When you take those bags out, you will take them to a location, you will dig a hole, you will put the bags in there, you will mark that hole. That is now biohazard waste. At the end of the emergency, you're going to have to have somebody come in here and take those and get rid of them. Or you can cheat. The emergency is over and my toilet works. Guess where the stuff from in those bags is going to go. I'm going to be wearing masks and fortunately with a mustache you can put some stuff on here that you don't smell anything else. But it's something that you have to think of. You don't want to just go out and go out in the forest and have a call of nature because if there are a lot of people there it's going to get really messy really quick. And if there happens to be poison oak there, it can get really interesting really quick. And you can include feminine hygiene items in this bucket. So now I have my porta potty bucket. I've got a dozen plastic bags in there. I've got four rolls of toilet paper. I have some female hygiene items for my wife. I got a big, one of those big things of handy wipes. It's all set. I'm good to go. Yes. Now, now, well, no. <laughs> Honest, that wasn't a pun. <laughs> um, now, if it happens to be January and it's snowing up here, <gasps> yeah, you can use it, but you're going to use it real quick. Clothing. You have to have some good clothing on, especially if, if it's a fire. My friend, unfortunately, when we had the lightning strike fire, was wearing a t-shirt, a pair of shorts, and flip-flops. Not what you have on, want to have on when you're evacuating for a fire. Long sleeve shirt long pants, good shoes. I, I, these are my town shoes. I normally wear combat boots. They're big. They have a really huge flat bottom. They have traction like you wouldn't believe so that I don't slip and fall down. In the event of a fire, the other thing you want to wear, get a hat and a handkerchief or some kind of mask on your face. How many of you are familiar with what an, N9, or an M95 mask is? Okay. Those are great for smoke, too. You want to put it on there. You don't want to get those ashes and stuff in. Um, when I was sitting out, out by the hospital during the fire, I looked out and I went, hmm, it's snowing. There were chunks of ash that big around just falling all over the place. Well, you don't want to suck that stuff in. So those little masks are good. The little masks can also be used to pour water through to purify it. 
they filter really well. Need a first aid kit, need to be able to treat injuries. You should carry a first aid kit in your car. All, all cars should have a first aid kit because the number of times you get scrapes and scratches and bumps and bruises and stuff doing something around your car. Uh, if you're like me, I carry a lot of Band-Aids. I have four Band-Aids in my wallet. I cut myself a lot. First aid kit should be able to treat all of your family members. So look at all of the different things that you're, you have as far as the people that you want to treat and include stuff in there. And don't forget prescription medications. I've got one of those little seven day pill things. I carry my car. I'm being a, a CERT team member, I actually have a CERT backpack that has all kinds of stuff in it. That's in that backpack. I can go anywhere and be assured I have at least seven days worth of medication. In our plan for our house, one of the things on the 15 minute list is the medicine cabinet. And it's basically, my wife has a nice little train case and it's going there and go, and it all goes in there. We take it all with us because I'm not sure which one I might need when. But if you take them all, you got it covered. And include a first aid book in the kit because there's a lot of things that might happen where you look and go, what should I do with this? Do I pull the piece of glass out of his arm? Mm, not wise. Because as you pull it out, you might cause more damage than when it went in. So I include a first aid kit. Here's an example of a first aid kit. Three sterile four by seven dressings, at least one triangle bandage, four two by two dressings, some elastic bandages, uh, bandage gauze, adhesive tape, eye pads and eye pad tape, some provodone iodine wipes, antiseptic ointment, ammonia inhalant ampules, and ibuprofen. The ammonia inhalant ampules come in handy when people start going, and you go, Tsh, and they go, whoa, and they're awake again. This is a good personal kit. Um, I lucked out, I happened to be able to get my hands on a complete Corman's first aid bag so I can treat about 30 people. The only thing they did is they took out the atropine so that if we happen to run into a nerve gas situation, I won't be able to people. Other than that, it's, it's great because it has a lot of stuff. I've used my first aid kit in my car a couple of times and as soon as I get home, I refill it. I make sure. If I use two Band-Aids out of there, I go home, open it up, put two more Band-Aids back in. Because the last thing you want to do is, well, I use two Band-Aids here, and I use two there, and I use one here, and I use one here, and I use one here, and you go, all the Band-Aids are gone. They make some great first aid kits, and they aren't that expensive. The one thing that you want to watch out for when buying first aid kits is there are some that have 95 little Band-Aids in them and two big ones. You want to get something that, like I said on this, that covers the gamut. You can treat really large wounds with the top ones. You can you know, treat medium size with the, with the third one down. And then you have some regular small Band-Aid Band-Aids in there. Self-protection. I'm going to talk about something that a lot of people probably don't like to hear about. And that's guns. In the event of a major, major incident, civilization is going to break down in a heartbeat. For any of you that saw the Rodney King riots, that thing moved through Los Angeles like a wave. And there weren't enough policemen to handle it. If you look at this county and you add up all the policemen and the sheriffs, there aren't a whole lot here. And when things really go down the toilet, they're going to be spread so thin, you're probably going to be on your own. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means you've saved up three months' worth of food. You haven't saved anything at all, but you know she has three months' worth of food. You're going to go visit and say hi. 
you want to share? And what happens when she says no? There are going to be people out there that if you have something they want, they're going to take it. If you can't defend yourself, they will. I'm not going to go any further than that. Um, if you want more information on it, you can talk to your local gun, gun club, or if anybody wants any more information on it, they can talk to me after this is over. Basic utilities. Most utilities, electric, water, natural gas, propane, require some form of delivery. When we had the uh, natural gas shut off for Willets, from, what was it, Calpell all the way up into Willets, shut down Howard Hospital. They had no heat, they couldn't cook food, and they couldn't sterilize instruments. Fortunately, we got on the radio and went, we need gas here now. I think it took about eight hours because we called the gas company and guess what? Their cell phones didn't work. They couldn't call the people they needed to call to do it. Finally, I ended up giving one of them a satellite phone and they got a hold of the people they needed to. And they brought in a great big truck with, with propane tanks on it or with uh, natural gas tanks on it and hooked into the hospital. They cut the line, shut off the city of Willis, and pumped it directly into the hospital. The hospital then had heat, they could cook, and they could sterilize their instruments again. The delivery could be ex interrupted for an extended period. If something ever happens to the gas line that comes into Willis, it could be a long time before you get gas. This time wasn't really that bad. The really bad part is you can't turn the gas on yourself. When they shut the gas off, I don't know how many of you noticed how many little PG&E trucks, LA Department of Water and Power trucks, San Diego power and power trucks were running around. They had to shut off every gas meter between Calpella and here before they could turn the gas back on. If they didn't, You'd be sitting in your house and say your stove was going when they shut off the gas. Your stove still turned on. Um, anything that has a pilot on it, suddenly you're going to get gas just coming out of there that's not burning. And if there's a spark anywhere, that gas follows the ground and it will find it and there will be a big explosion. That's why they had to come in here and shut everybody's gas off before they could turn it on. Now, they have everybody's gas shut off, they turn it back on. They had to go to every house and check every house when they turned it on to make sure that everything worked. Extremely, extremely labor intensive. Um, when I left the hospital to go home on uh, Tuesday, there had to be over 100 of those little PG&E trucks parked right there in the corner. And I passed convoys about four or five coming in, heading there, because the following day they were going to go out and spread out all over and, and turn the, or shut the gas off before they could turn it on. And then many appliances require more than one. Furnace, gas, and electricity. Gas for the heat, electricity to pump it through the house. <laughs> Electric power, you need power for everyday functions. Virtually nobody's house is going to function unless they're on a complete separate solar system without some kind of power. Backup generator is the best power that you can have. I actually have two. I have a big one that's hooked to the house and I have a small one that used to be hooked to the house and wasn't big enough to run the house. So that's now my backup to my backup. It has to meet your basic electrical needs. The problem that I had with the smaller one, I had a quarter horsepower well pump and I had a heavy duty pressure pump. And if they both went on at the same time, not enough power to surge power for it. So I got a bigger one that works great. Gasoline should be replaced annually. I recommend replacing about every three months. They have a uh, chemical called Stabil. You can put that in your gas and it will stabilize it so it doesn't break down. Gas ages. If you get gas that's really old, it doesn't work. I cheat. I belong to Safeway's Safeway Club thing, you get earn Safeway points that you can use at the gas station. 
You get 10 Safeway points, they take a dollar off. Gallon of gas. I have five five gallon cans, and once every three months, I go in there and I fill all five of them. I take what's in there, pour it in my vehicle so I can use it up. But I have fresh gas every three months. That gas will last you X period of time. It depends on how much you run your generator and how big your generator is. If you decide you're gonna run everything in your house, you're gonna go through that gas in a heartbeat. If you decide, okay, I'm gonna turn on my generator when I need to pump water from my well into my tank, and when I need to pressurize my pressure tank, then I'm gonna turn it off. It's gonna last a lot longer. Generator, only run it when needed. One hour on, three hours off will sustain a refrigerator. Providing you don't have teenagers who walk up and go and expect something to magically appear inside that refrigerator while they hold the door open. Um, same thing. Avoid opening your freezer as much as possible until you've eaten everything out of it. You might want to take a bunch of things out at once and then close the door to try and maintain the cold inside the freezer. Water, loss of electricity means loss of water. Is there other water available? A well, water tank, pond, or stream. You can have a backup generator or solar panels or a hand pump for well systems. I actually have a hand pump and there's a fitting on the top of my well that I can unscrew and hook the hand pump to and pump by hand if I need to. Hopefully I will never need to. And then have buckets for bleach and for purification. I would, I would recommend, if you're using the buckets for the purification, to get something that's fairly substantial, because if you put a lot of bleach and a lot of water and a lot of bleach and a lot of water and it's a plastic, it's gonna, gonna eventually um, cause the plastic to fail. You can use any kind of a bucket to get the water out of the stream. Propane and natural gas. Gas lines may be ruptured or the gas company may say, they don't really need gas up there, and they turn it off. Coleman type propane stove for cooking and heating water is really the only way you can do it. You can get the, they still, I think they still make the white gas ones where you can put the white gas in. But a two burner Coleman stove will cook just about anything that you want. And you can cook two things at once. You can heat water on one side and cook your meal on the other. Don't use it for heating in the shelter because of the fumes. You wanna make sure that you're, you're venting that. And have extra fuel canisters. I keep a dozen on hand. The reason I keep a dozen on hand is I have my Coleman stove. We have friends who come up to visit. They stay in the little cabin that's 600 feet away. They use the Coleman stove. Sometimes they use the Coleman lantern. Wood stove can be used for heating the shelter and it can be used for cooking. You can put a, put a pot on top of a wood stove and cook on it. There's some people up here that, that all of their cooking is done on wood stoves. And solar showers for heating, like I said before, have one for heating, drinking, and cooking water, and one for taking showers. Communication, cell phones and computers may not work. How many are familiar with this occurring recently? Have a portable AM FM radio for info, and buy one that's got the hand crank. Batteries wear out. You can use that hand crank on your, on your radio virtually forever until you crank it right off the radio. FRS and GMRS radios. Family radio system, uh, general something, general mobile radio system. Those little handheld, those little black things, the little, um, yeah, those little walkie talkies. They're great for short distances. You can go, you can read the little thing on the label and it says, good for 18 miles. If you're in the Mojave Desert and you are standing on one mountaintop and the person you're talking to is on another mountaintop, yeah, you might get 18 miles. If you're in this area, you get a mile, you're doing really, really, really good. Might be able to do it down on some of the straightaways on, on 101 down in the, in the Ukiah Valley. Up here in Willits, never happened. Those are line of sight radios. You put anything between you and that radio and it's not gonna work. I'm a ham radio operator, but my wife isn't, and I have a ham radio in my Jeep and in my truck. 
I can talk, she can't. We have two of those. Here, dear. If we get separated at all, hi, here's where I am. Now, if we really get separated, she turns my radio on. You can listen to ham frequencies all you want without having a license. You just can't talk. But I can pick up mine and say, hi, here's where I am. Then she knows where I am. Of course, then it's up to her to find me because I don't know where she is. Ham radios are good for short distances and long distances. We have a system set up in this county where you can talk anywhere in this county and anywhere in Lake County, regardless of whether it's a cell phone dead area or not. The ham radio repeaters in this county worked during the entire fire event and we could talk any place we wanted to. Long distances, I have one at home, a number of guys also have them here. I have no problem talking to St. Louis. I have no problem talking to anywhere pretty much west of the Mississippi. Some problems in Texas, getting all the way across to Louisiana. But there again, the, the HF, um, and I'm only using 100 watts. You can use up to 1,500. There are some people who, <laughs> we, did, we did a little thing uh, two years ago in the little park area behind the museum. We're talking to Croatia from the museum on 100 watts. I'm sitting there going, how? I don't know. You can find a ham living near, your, near you and ask for assistance. Now, one of the things that we're doing, we have different people who have ham radios. They actually have a ham radio set up at Howard. They have a ham radio set up at uh, Ukiah Valley. They have a ham radio set up at Northbrook. These are permanent installations in those medical facilities. All they need is somebody to operate the radio. Um, I think Ukiah Valley has two ham radio operators on staff. And is it Little Lake Clinic? The clinic behind where the old hospital is? They have a couple of ham radio operators on staff. The problem is, in an emergency, they aren't ham radio operators, they're hospital staff. They have jobs they need to do in the hospital. The guy who runs IT for Ukiah Valley and uh, Howard is a ham radio operator. You know what? He wasn't on the radio at all. He was running back and forth trying to get all the IT equipment in the hospitals to operate. But if you can find a ham radio operator near you, you can find out what's going on. A little thing on ham radio. I, as a ham radio operator, cannot talk directly to a radio station. That has to come through the public information officer at the emergency operations center. They are the only ones who are permitted to give out emergency information. I can talk to other hams. So if I'm trying to get down the hill into Ukiah, and all of a sudden there's a bunch of fire trucks and everything and flame and I can get on there and let all the other hams know. I can't talk to the radio station and say, here's what's going on. That's not within my authority and I don't want to lose my radio license. I can let the emergency operations center know because we have a ham radio permanently installed in the emergency operations. And actually we have both kinds, long and short distance. I can let them know and then if the public information officer wants to call the, the um, or contact the civilian radio stations, they can let them know. But I can't. On the other hand, if you're sitting at home and you go, Mike has a ham radio. Doot, 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 doot. Hi, Mike. What's going on? I can tell you. We're talking on the phone. I had... When the phones went out, the phones went out based on long distance, basically. Up in Laytonville, you could dial the 894 area code, or the 984, and you could talk there. We couldn't talk out. The same thing here. You could dial within Willits, but you couldn't talk out. Because what happened is up on Laughlin Peak is the building that uh, AT&T has where you talk from your phone into a building here, 
That building has a microwave antenna on it, it goes zzz, and it ties into everything else. The roof of that building caved in, it burnt, burnt down so bad. And if you go up there and you look at the big antenna towers, they have those big white covers on them. They used to have those big white covers on them. They all melted off. That's how intense it got up there. So you couldn't call out. Fortunately, last spring, the guy who owns the ham radio site said, would you mind coming up here and doing a little brush clearing? I went, no. And a couple of us went up there and we cleared 50 feet all the way around the building. The building didn't even get scorched. You know those yellow things they put on the guy lines on telephone poles so you don't walk into them? He lost six of those. They melted off. Other than that, everything up there worked. What happened with the other ones is the trees grew up close. The reason all those plastic things melted off is they had 60 and 70 foot dug firs on fire all the way up to the top. That heat radiated out and took the covers right off the microwaves. If you can find somebody who's near you, you can probably get information about what's going on. When I left in the morning, I turned my radio on at home. I have a dual band radio. One was on the CAM countywide emergency frequency, and one was on the CAL FIRE TAC 8, which is where they were explaining everything that was going on. My wife sat there. She knew everything that was going on, so she could tell the neighbors when they called her, when they walked up and knocked on the door, and, hi, does Mike know? Oh, Mike's gone, okay. She could also hear me. She knew I was safe. Because she'd hear my call sign, she'd go, he's at the hospital and he's still alive, which is really good. So if you find someone who lives, lives near you, you can ask them for information. They can give you information one-on-one. -on -one. We just can't give information out to radio and TV. That's up to the public information officer. My biggest job the first Monday was killing rumors. According to rumor control, Howard Hospital evacuated four different times. You know what? Howard Hospital ran just the way it normally does. There were no problems. There was no evacuation. They released people. They accepted people. Everything worked great. They just couldn't cook very much when they turned off the gas. The library is part of the county system. The county has its own vault up there. And the county system up in the vault didn't get damaged. So they probably were able to connect from here to their vault and then out. It wasn't going over the AT&T lines. Ham radios will work in cell phone dead areas. I can drive from here all the way down to Fort Bragg on Highway 20 and I can talk any place I want to. If you try and do that with your cell phone, good luck. As a matter of fact, the emergency phones that are on Highway 20 are satellite phone system. Mendocino County is the first county in the United States to install all satellite phone emergency call boxes. Because there are so many call boxes we put in and they wouldn't work. You couldn't talk to anybody. If you can't talk to them, what good are they? So we're, we're actually the, uh, the test entity for the satellite emergency call box system uh, countrywide. Or you can become a ham radio operator. Now, a little bit on becoming a ham radio operator. The Federal Communications Commission licenses all ham radio operators. The American Radio Relay League works with the Federal Communications Commission and the uh, Amateur Radio Relay League actually does all the testing, all the grading. It does everything to do with the licenses, except issue them. We send a little piece of paper to the FCC, and they issue the license. They have three, three categories. They have a technician, a general, and an advance. Technician is all you need to get on the emergency radio system for this whole county. And not just the emergency system, some of our just regular chat around systems. We have five independent repeaters in the county that are just high, you know. I call somebody on the countywide, hey, meet me on, and I give them the frequency, they switch over there, and we talk there so we don't tie up the countywide net. All you need is a technician license for that. 
to get the high, the long distance, you need either a general or, a, or an advanced license. It's a 35 question test, taken out of 458 questions in a great big list. If you know how to memorize stuff, you can pass that test. I was a radio operator in the, in the Marines, and I know how to turn them on, I know how to talk, I know how to turn them off, I know how to do maintenance. If it broke, I turned it over to the radio repair section. I sat down with a book that had all the, the questions and answers in it, and I read that book five times, I missed one question on the test. And I went, hmm, that's not too bad. I waited about six months and went, I want to see what this high frequency is. I got the book for the general, read it about five times. I missed two on that one. You can miss seven. And I got my general license. Can I fix a radio? Do I know what amps and watts and all this means? But I can operate a radio legally. And over time, from talking to guys who do know how to build their own radios and antennas and everything else, I picked up a lot. So I know a lot more. Still don't know the difference between watts and amps and all the rest of that, but I know how to do some other things. So you might want to look at becoming a ham radio operator. Um, it's fun. And you can talk to a lot of people all over the county. If you get a general license, you can talk to a lot of people all over the, West, all over the Western United States. Okay, additional training. You can take the CERT training. What's a CERT training? CERT is a training that's offered by FEMA, free of charge. It's three Saturdays in a row. And it covers what we're covering now, um, fire prevention and how to, just how to use a fire extinguisher. Most people don't really know how to use a fire extinguisher. You actually get to go outside and put out a fire with a fire extinguisher in this class. Um, we have five, five and a half hours of advanced first aid. Um, how to start the breathing, stop the bleeding, and treat for shock. What happens when Johnny ends up with a broken leg and Phil is having a heart attack and there's one ambulance? You know where it's going? It's going to Phil's house. Bill has a life-threatening situation. Johnny has a boo-boo as far as they're concerned. Who takes care of Johnny? You do. We teach you how to improvise a splint to at least stabilize the fracture until you can get medical treatment. A lot of the stuff that we, we teach in our first aid is, here's how you stabilize a person until appropriate medical people can come and take care of them from that point on. We teach um, search and, search and yeah. I always say search and, search and seizure because I was in law enforcement too long. Search and rescue. Um, and basically search is you're going in and you're finding stuff. Rescue is when you're saving somebody from that situation. So I come in here and I search this room and I find somebody underneath that table. Now I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to get them out from under that table and I'm going to move them out. So that's the difference between search and rescue. Um, we teach hazardous materials and what to do in hazardous materials incidents. Um, disaster psychology. Because in a real major knock down, drag out earthquake, you're gonna see things you've never wanted to see before and never wanna see again. And how to handle it and how to help other people deal with it. So we cover all of these things. And then at the very end, you get to practice everything. We set up an entire disaster simulation. We put you all together in teams and say, here's the problem, go handle it. And we evaluate how you do. So that's the CERT training program. A little history on the CERT training program. 1983, the LA Fire Department sent some people to Japan to find out what they did for earthquakes. And they got there and they found out, well, this neighbor had a little group of people that knew first aid. And these people knew a little bit about search and rescue. These people knew a little bit about firefighting. They came back and said, 
why don't we put together a little team and we'll teach all of these people how to do all of these things. So they started to put together this team and in 85 the Mexico City earthquake occurred. So they sent some people down there. The Mexico City earthquake, they saved 700 people who were trapped. These are just spontaneous volunteers. Came in and saved 700 people who were trapped. 100 of those volunteers died doing it. They weren't trained what to do. So they came in there, they saved people, but a lot of them died. And they said, we don't want that to happen. So they put together this team of 30 people. Shazam, the Whittier Narrows earthquake occurred, and they went, we need a lot more than 30 people. And they expanded it to the entire fire department. They have over 1,600 CERT team members there now. FEMA, 1973, looked and went, that's a dynamite program. Let's expand it for hurricanes, floods, fires. No, why is it just an earthquake program? The program's offered in all 50 states and six countries right now. One of the people I took the CERT train the trainers course with back in, at the Emergency Management Institute has been more places in the world since I took that course than I could ever think of being. She was at the Mount Everest earthquake. From there, she went to Bangladesh. She sent me a picture of the 400 people she, she trained on how to use a fire extinguisher in a refugee camp. She's probably trained more people than I've seen, but that's what the CERT program is about. And when you're done with it, you get this nice little certificate that says you have CERT training. CERT training is designed to teach you how to take care of you, your family, and your friends. That's a basic premise. Now, you take care of you, your family, and your friends. Everything's going good. Everybody here in the neighborhood is doing okay. At that point, if you want to come to a team, you come to a team, and the teams are helping in other locations. So the, the CERT team, per se, is a secondary. We have a team in Brooktrails, Ukiah, Elk, Fort Bragg, they're putting one together in Covalo. I just finished teaching out there. Um, I did one in Boonville. Nobody from Boonville showed up. We had people from Ukiah, Kamchi, and uh, Philo, but nobody from Boonville showed up, so they don't have a team. The one thing that's nice about being a team, you get to know one another, know your capabilities, get some extra training, and to be a team member, there's some extra things. There's two courses FEMA requires. Uh, both of them have to do with the incident command system, which is a nationwide uh, system now. When they had Katrina in 2005, had some major problems. This police department and this police department couldn't talk to each other. This fire department and this fire department couldn't talk to each other, and they couldn't talk to the National Guard. And FEMA sat down and went, uh, we got to fix this. And they came out with the incident command system. Every fire truck in, out in the state of California can talk to every other fire truck in the state of California now. Every police department can talk to every police department, and they can talk to the National Guard, and they can talk to the fire trucks. So that's what the incident command system is. And it has a whole organization chart on, here's the incident commander, and here's this, and here's the public information officer, and the logistics officer, and blah, blah, blah. They put the whole thing together. There are two classes that FEMA requires you to take before you can become a CERT team member. You can do the classes online by going to FEMA. And that's how I did it. And I sat down there and I went through and I got about halfway through. No, oh, that's enough for tonight. Went two days later, went back in, right to where I left off and finished it. Or you can take the Reader's Digest version. The Department of Health and Human Services, once a month, offers a class at their facility. It's about three and a half to four hours. And at the end of that class, you get your completion certificates for both. Once you have those done, so you have your CERT training, you have those two classes done, you have to be have a background investigation done by the Sheriff's Department. Why? Um, 
if we're going to send somebody to help over it at the hospital because of a disaster, we don't want to send a drug user. If we're going to send somebody over to Northbrook to help with the people who are over there, we don't want somebody who has a conviction for stealing from the elderly. So they do a background check. And once you pass the background check, you're good to go. The next class will be January 27th, February... January 27th, yeah. February 3rd and 10th at Howard Hospital, or Howard Hospital, at Howard Forest, the Cal Fire facility up on the top of the hill. They have a phenomenal classroom up there. So if anybody's interested in taking the CERT class, there's brochures back there that have the date and everything. It's 100% free. Now, one of the things we don't talk about is CPR training. When we talk CERT, we're talking to the greatest good for the greatest amount in the shortest period of time. CPR training is very labor intensive. So I walk in this room and all you people are laying on the floor and I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna start checking. You're not breathing. I start CPR while I'm doing CPR on you. On you. you die, bleed to death, you bleed to death, and you die of shock. On the other hand, if I don't do CPR on you, I save those three people. Greatest good for the greatest number in the shortest period of time. We don't teach CPR, but I highly recommend t taking it. The Red Cross now has a combined CPR ADT, automated defibrillator training, all rolled into one. It's about a seven hour class, but it's good for two years. You can get your certificate. The other thing we talk about is community mapping. What is community mapping? You're gonna to get together with the people who live around you, and you're gonna to talk to them. You say, what are you doing for emergency preparedness? And most of them will say, no, no, And then you say, well, what I'd like to do is get the community together, find out where everybody's gas meter is, find out where everybody's water is, find out where everybody's electricity is. So in the event of a disaster and we have to turn off the gas, we don't have to go searching high and low through bushes and everything else to find out where your meter is. We'll know. We know that Mary over there is in a wheelchair. She doesn't have a car. She's pretty much not able to move around. So in a disaster, we need to have somebody go over there and check and see how she's doing. You're going to get your neighborhood together to get prepared for an emergency and find out where the problems are. This place has, has this, this place has this, this place has this. Now, is everyone gonna, get, everyone gonna play? Nah. You're gonna walk up and knock on somebody and go away, don't bother me. Other people are gonna go, you know, that's not a bad idea. Let's get together and do it. We had that happen uh, up where I live, up in, up in Cherry Creek, and we got a number of people going, yeah, that's a good idea, let's find out. Well, we know where everything is, for ours, the other people, they're on their own. There's not much you can do if they don't want to play. And I'm going to give you one bonus thing on fires. When I was working for the police department, I went to a fire in Malibu. I got up to a street and I looked down the street and there were 12 houses. 11 burnt to the ground, one was fine. Not a scorch mark on it. And I walked up and I looked at the house. I went, how did he do that? And I looked up. You look up at the eaves of a house, you'll see the two by fours that run down. The guy had taken sheet metal, run it down the front, across the bottom, down the wall, and stuck it over it. Embers couldn't swirl up in there and set those beams on fire. And that's how most of the house is burned down. The roofs start first. And then he had a pool. And up on the roof, he put a rainbird on each end, had a line that came down to a pump that he threw in the pool and went and went away. And then he watered an area all the way around his house plus his entire roof. He saved his house. He saved his yard. He didn't even lose the, lose the bushes out in the yard. I put one of those on my house. My stress level went boof. Three of my neighbors have seen that they now have them on theirs. So that if there's an emergency up there, 
I walk outside, I have a 2,500 gallon water tank, I fire up my generator, I turn on my rainbirds, and I leave. Generator will run 11 hours. Rainbird. Sprinklers, yeah. I went down to Ukiah and found the ones that they use out in the vineyards that shoot like 40 feet. Oh yeah. I have a manufactured home that's 48 feet long. Those two rainbirds will actually cover each other. They will cross over on the roof. Now the only thing that I had was one little problem. They shoot really far. They wouldn't get my redwood deck. So there's a separate one that fits right on the center railing of the redwood deck. And it waters the whole deck in the front of the house. And if something happens, I, adios, fire up my generator and off I go. And hopefully I'll come back 11 hours later and the house will still be there. Yes, what he did, if you look up in the eaves of the house, you have the roof and you have the two by fours that come down that hold the roof up. He had taken sheet metal and he had run it down the very front, then across underneath and then down the side of the house. So you couldn't see those two by fours at all. And then he put some stuck over it to match the rest of the house. And it blended right in. The house looked fantastic, but that stuff wouldn't catch on fire. Okay. In summary, disasters can occur anytime, so you have to prepare your plans now. Go home, read through that handout, decide what you want to do that will make you feel comfortable. Some people will do the minimum. Some people will look at it and go, hey, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit of all of this. But do what you do will make you, you feel comfortable. Prepare to that level. Talk to your family members and make sure they're also prepared. Fortunately, my wife is, looked at me, and at first she went, rolled her eyes a lot, you know, heard them roll across the floor. Now she's going, I am really glad you are prepared. Because if anything happens, I know what to do, and I know we're prepared. And when you actually look at it, we had the big fire in Lightonville four years ago. Massive fires three years ago in Lake County. Big fires last year in Lake County. Now we had the Redwood Potter Valley and Lake County had one at the same time, not counting what happened to Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa is toast. It looks like Berlin after World War II when you go down there. An ounce of preparation is worth a ton of anguish and confusion. If you're prepared, when that knock comes on the door, you hear something on the radio, or you see something on the news, your anxiety level is going to be a lot less because you go, I have a plan, I know what I'm gonna do. As opposed to, eh, and running around the house, waving your arms, trying to figure out what you're gonna do. You can do as much as you want. You can look at that list and go through and go, okay, I'll do this, I'll do this. I'll come up with a plan for what I'll take in the first 15 minutes. And after that, everything's gone. After that, I'll walk around and look and say, okay, I can take this and this and this. I just have my wife, my wife tells me that I'm anal retentive sometimes, that I have a tendency to overdo everything. She looked and went, that's a great list, I like that. The one problem with earthquakes is you never can tell. You can have a slip fault that suddenly it'll go or it can, you know. The one thing you can be sure is if it does go, the east side of California will be a little farther north than the west side. And one of the other things a lot of people don't realize is how many of you knew that Albion is actually on the Pacific plate, not the North American plate? Albion. The San Andreas Fault goes into the ocean between here and Albion. We're, we're actually on the Arizona side of the San Andreas Fault. Albion's on the Pacific Ocean side. I, I think Little River probably is too. Yeah. And the other thing is, if you actually look at the US, U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey maps, you can follow the San Andreas Fault. 
It goes up just uh, off of Eureka. There's a little plate that sits there. I think it's a Juan de Fuca plate or something like that. The other end of the Juan de Fuca plate is the start of the Cascadia slip zone. So if the San Andreas were to go, hit all the way up to there and go through that plate, it'll hit Cascadia and go all the way up into Canada, which would probably be in excess of a 10. We would have a heck of a ride. Fortunately, we haven't had, had any really that bad. Any other questions? <laughs> Believe me, I haven't always been well prepared. But I, when I walked over to my friend's house while Cal Fire was there and they all were running around, I went, um, we need to be a lot better prepared than we are. And I sat down, I started doing all the stuff. Then I took the cert training. And at the time I took the cert training, um, then the people at North Coast Opportunities, who who is actually... I work for North Coast Opportunities who works for the Office of Emergency Services on a contract. So I ac actually report to them or to the, directly to the Emergency Operations Center. They found out I had a law enforcement background. I went, how'd you like to be the coordinator for the county team? And I went, mm, okay, I haven't got anything else to do. I went to my first meeting in Ukiah. Two members showed up. I went to my first meeting in Brook Trails. Three members showed up. And I went, okay, those are the two teams we have in the county now. Maybe we need to do more training. And that's what we've been doing. Um, I did four classes last year. We, we got approval to do five this year. But every year, there's one down up at Howard Forest because we can get the Willis Brook Trails and Ukiah people there. And every year, there's one down at Fort, at Fort Bragg because we get the North, one, or North Highway 1 all the way down into Elk, people will come to Fort Bragg. And that's primarily because I just don't like driving Highway 20 a lot. What's really, what's really fun is driving Highway 20 in a three quarter ton truck, pulling the CERT emergency trailer at, it must have been six o'clock in the morning, pouring down rain. The windows kept fogging up and the road kept sliding. Last year, the amount of rain we had, we had, we had 104 inches at my place up in Laytonville. I quit counting the slides on Highway 20 when I hit 25. I think half of Highway 20 slid last year, or had a slide on it. If, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you one thing. If I can get one person who is sitting in this entire room to prepare for anything, I've, I've accomplished something. Because, yeah. Because I'll tell you, it's going to keep happening. We live in a forest. We're going to have fires. And who knows? You know, last year we had 104 inches of rain. 2005 we had 102 those are the two big years, but in 2005 at my house, I had 21 inches of rain between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in 48 hours. And I was sitting there watching water flow around both sides of my house. I, it looked like I was on, on an ark because of the volume of water. And we had four places up there where the water was flowing across the roads. Fortunately, we didn't have a slide on one of the main roads. If we had a slide on one of the main roads, it would have been all over. Since then, we actually, uh, we had an old logging road that connects from where I am down to Highway 162. And I talked to the owners of the two parcels and said, would you mind if when we have the roads done, you just, we just run a grader down through that? And they went, no. So now we have another fire escape. 